And I want to welcome our guests. Um, so as you saw from a, pre a previous uh, talk that you know, Global Voices is really interested in languages and how um, you know, they, they take, you know, take form in, on the internet. And so when we were coming to the Philippines, uh, we were really kind of really excited to learn more about how you know, diversity of languages in the Philippines you know, across the entire country you know, is, is being seen on the internet. And so we invited a diversity of panel members here to talk about um, you know, not only their work, but also their knowledge of how different languages are used online and some of the tools that are being used to promote languages and support communities um, that are kind of, um, you know, promoting their language online. So I'd like to start with the first, just Joyce Guerra. Guerra? Guerra. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, who, who, who will be talking, who has a, um, she's, we'll be talking about sort of the diversity of languages on, in the Philippines and some of her thoughts on how um, the internet can play a role and help preserve some of the languages. Um, let me introduce all the other guests. We have Anol Mongaya, Bob Reyes, and Eugene Villar. So, thank you very much you know, for inviting. Uh, the first time I, I heard about you know, Global Voices is when I met um, Miss Georgia, um, you know, in uh, September of last year, and so I was telling her that, you know, it should really be here in Cebu. I mean, you know, for, for those who are locals, I mean, you would always, this is, you know, we always sell first what we have, but it's also because um, this has nothing to do with um, the rest of the Philippines. So it's just that, you know, you, you know uh, what your place is, and, uh, and you'd like people to also get to know uh, where they are. So, you know, and, and Thank you for you know for being here. It's a very interesting uh, group, and thank you for allowing me to give an overview of um, language. Um, so um, you know, I'm, I will be. I think the the perspective that I'm taking is that one, I'm um I'm an L1 speaker, so that means um, Cebuano is a is my native language, and uh, in in the context of um, you know the history of the Philippines, we've had so many layers of um, colonial um, you know, administration so that um, when language now becomes the medium for, um, you know, for domination, um, because, you know, this language is a very powerful tool in which, so we have changed, you know, from, from at some point in time, um, the different um, diverse languages, and then you'd have one dominant language being spoken, which is uh, at, at one point in time, uh, Spanish in administration and in, in, in prayer. And then later on, um, the American um, colonial government had a very strong impact it, because it was far more systematic. It was not just the church, but now it was the educational system. But, um, but also, so that's, that's the context that I'm coming from. So I'm, um, and second is that, um, and being trained in anthropology, uh, you are given a much wider perspective. Uh, you begin to understand you know, the role of your culture, you know, the way of life, how, how y one's culture also shapes one's, one's worldview. Um, the, you know, the, the way you look at the world is always shaped by the people that um, gives you the, you know, the, that language. So therefore, um, when you speak of language um, from, um, from the perspective of an L1 speaker, you don't only learn about um, the word itself, but you also learn all the emotions that comes with it. So that what happens is when I greet you in, in, um, in Filipino, it's mabuhay, so you were taught this earlier. But when you come to a um, house in Cebuano or in a Visayan speaking region, you would always say, maayo. So you will shout, you know, you say, maayo na itaw, you know, uh, ma, you know, good, you know, it's like, it's maayo, it's good, it's really wishing you well. I'm wishing you well, and I'd like to know if there's someone else in the house, no? Or um, we would always say, maayong, we, we qualify, maayong buntag, maayong gabi, or when we meet people on the road. I was taught this one. Um, you know, we'd always say, if, even if you don't, even if you don't know, um, this is a stranger, we'd always say, you know, you always greet the person. So this is the context and this is so that um, what happens is in the Philippines um, and the first map I, I um, 
you know, I'm not so, where, where is it? I'm not so technically gifted. I'm the... Okay, um, I'm presenting to you, thanks, Anul, you know. Um, I'm, pres I'm providing you two kinds of map. One is from Ethnologue. Um, this is a, um, there's a big project um, in the, you know, this was um, done by the Summer Institute of Linguistics way, way back when I was still, you know, um, a young student and, you know, you always go to the field <laughs> and they will ask you to fill out questionnaires. So, you know, you, you see over the, so it's the first map, is, it shows the relationships of the language with the Philippines and some of its neighboring um, groups. Second, the second map is a map of the, you know, the country, just to show you its uh, geographical distribution as far as the different islands. So we are all, we're destined to be speaking different uh, languages by, by region. I mean, you know, language is always, you know, um, isolation of a place will always lead to a language. And in fact, they, they would say, in, in, in fact, in the islands, like if you go around, if you have the chance to go around the Visayas, you'd, you'd really um, see that if people live across two different um, shore, I mean, you know, if you live opposite um, a body of water, you're most likely to speak more or less the same language as when someone who lives, um, you know, behind you with, with a mountain between uh, yourselves. That's, that's very logical. So that um, in the Philippines, we have According to, there's a very, um, I'd like to point out um, a study uh, being done. Uh, there's a human genome project being done, um, you know, and um, there were four things that they uh, found out, which I'd like to cite here. First is the Philippines being an archipelago is connected to the Sunda uh, landmass, and which has facilitated migration to and from uh, the Philippines, so that it, this is really very fluid. There is no such thing as border. It's a, it's a, you know, when you talk about closing your borders, this is a major problem, you know, um, because there's just so much. Second, um, well, for a very long time, um, fossil record, you know, in, and from the perspective of anthropology, and when you look into the history of human evolution, you'd always say, you, sometimes there's this notion that you will always have a claim to the land if you have the oldest person. So there's always this contest in the field of anthropology. But in the Philippines, um, our oldest was Tabon, um, the Tabon skull, but later on they found um, an artifact of Talao which could date between 46 to 67,000, which pushes back um, the age of, um, you know, the first um, individual that came to the Philippines. But, um, so basically it also indicates an ancient occupation. However, um, because of very uh, poor preservation plus, um, you know, um, many different factors, the archaeology is not so good, um, it's, it's even problematic to really figure out um, what were the other populations that went with Kalao men. Third, um, the Filipino population, um, ethno-linguistic groups, because of the islands, is composed of over 170. This was cited in the study, but in Ethnologue, um, they have cited about 185 different languages. Can you imagine, um, you know, ethno-linguistic groups in the Philippines? Um, and, um, you know, but all Philippine languages are Austronesian, and they may have played a very important role in, um, you know, if um, the, the assumption is from Taiwan through the Philippines to the um, to Oceania and back. So there was this um, very rapid movement. So, um, you know, the Philippines is composed of 7,000. It's uh, it's accepted as 7,000 um, islands. Um, and um, it has, it's clustered into three major groups, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And it is divided into 17 regions. Actually, there's more um, regions now because there were more created. 80 provinces, 138 cities. This has also grown um, because there were more cities that uh, came in. And can you imagine 1,496 municipalities and 42,000 districts? So you can imagine the the magnitude in terms of organizing it from the perspective of uh, governance. Um, so, what ha so basically, um, when you look into the Philippines, uh, can I have the next slide? 
So this is how it looks now. No, this is from um, Ethnologue, and it speaks of the population. This is 92,000. I've checked. Um, the Philippine population is about 100 million, and the growth is 1.89 percent um, from one census year to the other. So this is really um, quite quite very fast population growth. And the literacy. Um, so the majors. I've said earlier, the major languages are um, well. English as enshrined in the Constitution as well as uh, Filipino and of course Tagalog um, became a major and dominant la language basically because you know when the Gaspi moved from Cebu to, to Manila um, Manila became the, the center of um, so um, and the um, literacy rate is around 98 percent although uh, this is you know, for, for those who come from the Philippines, is, I really question this one because, you know, what do you, what are the, you know, how do you say literacy? Is just read and write or is it really um, intrinsically understanding the written and, um, and the spoken word and be able to express oneself? And also, second, is there are two components here. Is, um, is it just the literacy of um, an L2 or is it the literacy of an L1? Because these are, in terms of really understanding later on, this will have an impact, especially on education. So this brings me, um, of the major, so in Cebuano, uh, is around, has around 20 million speakers um, in, in the whole, in the whole of uh, the Philippines. So it's a, it's a thriving language. Now, um, over the, you know, when Anola and I were students, this was, it was, we were always fine uh, when we speak the, the local, the di at that point in time, it's called the dialect. So you get to pay five centavos at that point in time, that's a lot of money. And um, so, you know, we were being forced, but, you know, over the years, there is this, and it's a very good development that now there is this uh, looking into self-determination and trying to really appreciate people's understanding of one's own language. After all, going back, you know, as I said earlier, language, com you know, comprises your view of the world, how you are. It's actually the, um, the language of your soul. So, in fact, in worship, this is um, very clearly manifested um, in, in many of the different, um, you know, living outside of the Philippines for quite a long time. A lot of people may speak the second language, L2, but when they want to worship or they pray, we ask them, they always will pray in their uh, native, in, in their, in their uh, mother language, L1. Because this is very, this is very important um, also. Second, um, I think with this development now, wherein you have really people trying to appreciate one's um, mother language, like in this context, one. It also brings that, it also gives you, um, gives back the dignity of, you know, um, a people back to where it should be. So for a long time, um, you know, uh, this is, you know, where biases, because the, the other thing is when your language is never understood and appreciated, this is where you will have your biases, of course. And then you would always say that if there's a heavy Cebuano, uh, accent that will always be made and, and you know these are because you know it embodies a lot of uh, stereotypes also so um, lately um, in Cebu this has been there's a, a, a very strong movement of um, native uh, speakers uh, wanted to um, put this back into the curriculum because a lot of our young people unfortunately cannot speak you know that's why I always go back to the question of literacy because a lot of them really cannot speak Cebuano anymore, you know. Um, and, and you can really see how, how sometimes, okay, for example, Ha'in and Di'in are two different. Ha'in is, you look for, it's Di'in and Ha'in are two, it's where. But it's in the usage that you will have to, to um, really differentiate it. Because when you say Ha'in, you will ask is, um, or Ha'in or Asa, no? Um, ha'in ang, where is, where is the projector? So you will say, ha in the, the most appropriate is ha in ang pro where ha in ang projector. Where is the projector? But when you say, but when you say when you ask for a place, you can also say asa ang capital. Where is the capital? And when you want to ex um, know exactly, then you will say asa dapit ang capital. 
So, you know, these are the qualifiers. And when you look, and when we look into these languages, it's highly developed. You know, it has the subject, verb, object. It really tells you whether it's a position, you know, um, in place or whether it's moving. And it also tells you um, time. So this is, um, so what happens is, um, for a very long time, our young people were not taught this one. So that what happens is, I'll tell you, um, when you say, Cebuanos have a very strong uh, long E. It's always like B I R I is dire, no? but um, in in um, in English and in um, in uh, Filipino the the E is always soft. There's a distinction. So that what happens is I hear a lot of my students will say asa dire, you know, because you know why? Because this is the connotation of class. You know, and, and just you know sometimes I really I, I feel sorry, but on the one hand. I've seen a lot of, um, you know, signals coming online when they say Bisaya ko or when you go into, when you go into the, on Facebook, they would always already say something on Cebuano, which was not, you know, something that people would be caught dead, um, you know, when we were, so this is something, so in the, con so going back, so with, with this, now there were different groups that uh, formed, um, like there are language movements and groups, one of them is now the institutionalization of the teaching of mother, it's called mother tongue-based mother language education. Um, and uh, one group that is um, preparing for this is the Academy of Vinisaya. This is the Academy of Language in which I'm um, a member, but this is also by, by, also by other groups, no? um, individuals, advocates who really has the love for language. So um, there is now a dictionary um, and Together with the dictionary is that since there is already the, you know, the teaching, mandatory teaching of mother tongue based mother language education from grades one to three, this is really something that um, I think will, will give us hope. So in the context of this, um, we also know that working with, with you know, with, with teachers, we have found out that really the books are, you know, you need to have reading materials which are not present. So, and also considering that we're dispersed all over the different islands, you know, um, you may have Cebu and then you would have an island that's so beautiful for Pinatarkan, but you know, sometimes you can't go there every day, you know, you have to really uh, figure out, you have to go around me, because if you go around this time, chances are it's going to be a very rough ride. I mean, that's geography, you can change that. But, um, I think with, with internet and, and going online, I've seen, I've checked that a lot of um, other countries have been doing this. So maybe this is something that um, one will help or will facilitate the, the distribution and uh, creation of reading materials for the teachers. And also at the same time, it reinforces for the kids. And, and you know, some, you know um, from a um, subconscious level, the unconscious acquisition of, um, of language, um, you know, when, when something comes out, you know, of the internet, this is now the, you know, the dominance of media. You know, this, it also means that, you know, you have arrived and this is also something very legitimate. So I think, um, I, you know, going to the final question of what can, um, what can the internet do? The internet can do a lot. Um, of you know coming up with um, websites that really can cater to the needs of both language teachers as well as um, children exercises because books are very it takes a long time a book it will take you about two years um, you know a very simple book whereas if you develop it very well online you can put it there edit it immediately but I think a word of caution is that um, I've, I've seen also a lot of some pages that teaches um, wrong. So this has to be really carefully, um, you know, I think standards and criteria has to be put in. But um, for a country like the Philippines, whose resources are not, are, are quite, you know, are, are limited, um, I think the internet will be the cheapest way of really bringing um, and teaching language. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Anol Mongaya. Um, at our community meeting, he gave the members of Global Voices a crash course in Cebuano. So we're, we're fluent now, right? Uh, Anol is a, has, a, has a really interesting background. If you look on, on the website, you can see his profile. But he's a journalist, blogger, activist, 
Um, and so we invited him to talk a little bit about how the Cebuano language is, is being used online. Okay. Um, Basically, uh, the topic now is uh, Cebuano, Bisaya, and the internet. Uh, uh, Eddie gave us a guideline on what to talk about in initial, the initial introduction. So, here yeah, I just want to uh, smoothly uh, transition from Joy's uh, presentation. And, you know, this is another map. It's colored. And you will see that Cebuano it's not just spoken in Cebu. Cebu is in the center, but if you look at the blue, it's also spoken in different provinces, including in Manao. But there are also other Visayan languages. And this is Waray Waray, Dahili Gainon, Tinaraya. But then, we Cebuanos being uh, the dominant sector, more or less we, we, we tell ourselves and we pride ourselves that or equal or even better than Tagalog. And so we call, and, uh, so we call uh, Cebuano also as Bisaya or Bisaya. As if it's the only Bisayan language. It's not. So then, so we have a lot of things to sort out actually. So uh, Joy was uh, talking about Academia and Bisaya. And that's part of the effort to sort things out, come up with standards. And I, I, I'm happy that the topic called the provincial government was is very supportive. And in fact, most of the meetings are here. Here, OK. And uh, I attended one congress last year, Bisaya, uh, and it's being supported by the schools and the academia. And uh, it, it happened in USC, the University of San Carlos. So. Online, uh, there are a lot of Bisaya sites, like this one. It's more of language, translate. But I think and I noticed that there are problems with spelling and there's a need for uh, the academia and the, for the standard group to coordinate with all these developments online. And there are also, aside from the websites, we have also uh, the 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 message boards about Bisaya, there are a lot of uh, like this, and speaks one on Twitter, and we have also different apps. It's a more recent development, the apps, because as I, when we look at uh, our website in PRWorks, uh, when I look at the statistics, I notice through the, through the recent months, more people are going mobile and more of our views are mobile so uh, we have this uh, the google analytics and <laughs> inventions there's always the statistics that, you know most of these are mobile why okay so mainly also going online and apps now i want to go back to history in the internet here in cebu one of the earliest discussion boards we had and it's it had its own it had its own uh, uh followers and intense discussions and most of it are in cebuano it's historia.net and at that time there were many many sites like this but this is this one stayed on and it's still uh, alive and kicking today and according to the administrator they have around three hundred thousand registered users well that's good and discussions promote Cebuano offline uh, Sunstar uh, in, went into an initiative way back 1994 and we came up with uh, I'm involved with Sunstar I'm involved with this project and we came up with Super Balita it's a daily Cebuano newspaper. You'll see it there. Happy. Uh, this uh, began, we started this way back 1994. The year, the same year that internet arrived in the Philippines officially. And 
years later, we moved online and we came up with the website, and that's uh, Super Balita Online. Uh, our competitor also came up with uh, the Freeman, also have their own site, Cebuano, and they have their own paper. And I think this really is helping uh, spread uh, readership, spread uh, uh, discussions on uh, in Cebuano. And uh, online, uh, depending on the issues, there are also discussions. And uh, it's good, and people write in Cebuano, although not exactly the same way that Joy and the teachers wanted written uh, uh, we write in we call it the JJ type and no. then so there are also other sites uh, that comes up with Cebuano this is the Metro Cebu News uh, still a new uh, doesn't have more, much followers than the, the ones with the offline counterparts the newspaper counterparts but it's a development that other online uh, publications are also using Cebuano and they want to connect with the Cebuano audience. Now came Facebook, what year was that? So just a few years ago, Facebook came and usage of uh, Cebuanos really like to Facebook and most of, many of us join it and come up with discussions about Cebu and, you know, I just uh, a sample of the sites. There's the Cebu PH. It has uh, 587 likes as of now, today. Uh, I Love Cebu has 332 likes. That's the pages. And there's also the Bakadahan Cebu, the, the Facebook groups. There's uh, 35, 30 something. And there's another group. A more popular one, uh, the to, Together uh, Tagasibu, something like Tagasibu Ka Koi. You're, you're a Cebuano if it's like that, so it's more of jokes, it's more of, you know, like things about Cebu. And it has around 50 members now as of now. So these, these uh, developments are promoting uh, discussions in Cebuano online. Before, uh, Way back 2013, before the election, I, with a friend, uh, Fabino, we discussed these developments and we also tried to initiate something online on Facebook. Uh, how about something, a uh, discussion group on politics? And so, we came up with, I know, the, the Super Balita also uh, had with Facebook and also Bana came up with Facebook and you know, the Facebook trend. And then, we have this Magisco Kitag Politika Bay. It's a desktop politics trend. And we started with around 100, and the group grew, and now we have 9,250. It's not quite as big as the other ones that reach uh, 100,000, but the engagement is you know, every day there are debates, every day there are different issues in Cebu, and we discuss it, and we debate about it, and people fight, and it's a hard time, you know, uh, moderating it on a daily basis, so sometimes we just give it as that. And <laughs> so we have this development, and resulted in the spread of also memes uh, online, uh, about uh, that's Senator Miriam Santiago, and uh, it's spreading online. There's also about a local, a local politician and uh, about uh, this other one here in the corner, that's uh, Napoles, uh, the one involved, uh, the principal uh, involved in in the controversial court, court barrel anomaly that triggered the uh, One People Million March in Manila and which started, started on Facebook. And recently, there's this uh, call uh, by the Pope, and he just came up with that. A more recent development, uh, this, uh, I think, late last year and this year, um, a friend uh, from Sun Star also came out with 
uh, their own initiatives, local initiatives, and they came out to their own website and with a more uh, active uh, mobile version, the mycebo.ph. And you would notice, we discuss issues, they share it with Facebook, they share it with our group, uh, it's more about uh, what what's happening and what one, what can we do about it, there are discussions on that. And one thing I noticed about this, look, that, that on the other side, Rama threatens to close SRP to vehicle traffic. That's the mayor threatening to close uh, the, a major new highway to the south, the crucial uh, uh, highway um, that had recently accidents. And the mayor just dirted it up. I want to close it if you can't make, uh, if the traffic people can't, you know, can't uh, prevent all those things happening. And, you know, it has already 547 shares when I, uh, when I got this last night. So, you know, uh, I think online, there's, uh, there's a major development here and uh, people are joining in. Um, so, we also uh, use this for mobilizations. And, uh, well, this is fun, uh, part of our advocacy. And we introduced uh, uh, Facebook and, you know, uh, help uh, mobilize people through our group. But unfortunately, it's not, although Facebook has mobilized uh, our participation, but converting that into actual presence in mobilization offline is still a problem. But I think we're getting to that. And uh, this picture, uh, this uh, is about our uh, call online. And uh, the one with so many, uh, it's a People's Congress on the People's Initiative. Uh, it's, a, it's a coalition, it's a national coalition. And uh, it was held. The, the People's Congress was held here in Cebu because one of the initiators and a very, very uh, charismatic initiator was our own Cebu Archbishop, Jose Palma, and he signed, he was one of the first to sign the People's Initiative uh, against uh, for the abolition of court. So those are the kind of developments online. And I'm happy that uh, just today, I got this and I saw this in one of our Facebook groups on the anti court and shared it to Magistri Kita Kulitrabay. During Sinulog, just a recent Sinulog, students, young people are starting to organize on their own. And here is a signing station for the anti court movement. And they did it just last weekend. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next guest is Bob Reyes. He's a Mozilla representative in the Philippines, and he's also the lead of localization projects in the Philippines. I'll talk about how Mozilla is working to, you know, promote languages through localization projects of Firefox OS, Firefox, and and uh, when we did a, a gathering in Mexico, we also partnered with Mozilla Mexico, which you know I think we feel like we have a lot in common with, with Global Voices and Mozilla. Uh, promoting you know, open an open internet. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning. I'm Bob Reyes from the Mozilla Philippines community. So just to give you a background, uh, Mozilla is a global nonprofit. We are the name behind the Firefox web browser and now uh, the Firefox OS, the mobile operating system. So we are we're proud here in the Philippines that we have the cheapest, or uh, actually we call it the ultra uh, low cost. Uh, smartphone in the world. It's powered by uh, Trim Mobile. And of course, the brain system is made by Mozilla through Firefox OS. So here in the Philippines, um, we do not have a Mozilla employee. Worldwide, there are around a thousand Mozilla employees. And Mozilla is a global organization. So the backbone of the organization basically are our community members, our volunteers. So having around a thousand uh, uh, employees worldwide, we also, it's uh, the, the, the ratio is something like for every employee there are 10 volunteers so imagine how big the community is here in the Philippines what we normally do is 
we teach people uh, to be web literate. And one of the things that uh, we've been doing for the last 10 years is that we localize websites, products of uh, Mozilla like Firefox and Firefox OS. Okay? So it's not just translation, we call it localization. Why? All over the world, there are around uh, 90 languages wherein Firefox is being used. Uh, sad to say that in the Philippines, we started the localization for Tagalog, Iloco, uh, Cebuano, and uh, Chabacano. Except that, yeah, we don't have employees here in the Philippines. So most of them are, all of them are volunteers. And they can only contribute to the project during their free time. And the thing is, when we launch a version of Firefox, it is done every six weeks. That's how rapid our development for Firefox is. So it's rather really hard to um, cope with the new translations, uh, the strings to be uh, translated because if there's a new uh, version of a product, normally there are tons of strings being taken away from the product and there are new sets of strings being introduced. And you need your localizers to cope up with that speed, which is six weeks. So now we're focusing on the Tagalog. I'm from Manila. My dad is from Cebu, but he grew up in Manila. Okay. So uh, I don't know how to speak Cebuano, but my friends here in Cebu are asking, when are we going to have a localization of Firefox into Cebuano? So my my plea now is, if there are anyone who's fluent in speaking Cebuano and would like to contribute to have a translation of Firefox, Firefox OS, or any website of Mozilla for that matter, you are more than willing to be part of the community. So that's what we do in the Philippines. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce Eugene Villar from Wikimedia. He's the chairman of Wikimedia Philippines. Uh, both Mozilla and Wikimedia Philippines are sponsors of the summit. You can see their logo on, on the screensaver there. And he'll talk about how the local chapter of Wikimedia in Philippines is, is supporting different versions of Wiki, 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 Wikipedia and all of their wiki projects in different languages. Good morning. Um, my name is Richie Villar. And I'm a volunteer of the Wikimedia Philippines, which is a local chapter of the Wikimedia Foundation. As you may know, the Wikimedia Foundation operates the popular website Wikipedia. And we are proud to say that Wikipedia is the number one non-profit website in the whole world. Um, as you may know, Wikipedia is um, published in almost 300 languages. And here in the Philippines, we have around eight languages that have Wikimedia, Wikimedia editions. Um, among, among the 12 or 13 languages, languages here in the Philippines that have more than a million, million speakers, speakers, yes, we have around eight Wikipedias. Um, sad to say, um, one of the popular or, or most uh, spoken language here in the Philippines is Hiligaynon or Ilonggo, which is spoken in Western Messiahs, still does not have a Wikipedia in that language. So the question is, why does Hiligaynon do not have a Wikipedia? The problem is, in order to have a Wikipedia, you need to have a community behind it. So, okay. I will now go uh, give a short overview of how new Wikipedias are created in a, in a new language. So basically, what you need is really a core group of people speaking that particular language who wants to create a Wikipedia in their language. So what they, what they need to do is to create a request to the language committee. So the language committee is just a, a group of volunteers under the Wikimedia Foundation who deliberate and evaluate if creating a new Wikipedia in a, in a new language is feasible. So basically, okay, uh, one of the conditions we require is that the language has to have an ISO 639 language code. I think most of the uh, I think most of the languages that are documented by the Summer Institute of Public Linguistics already have their own ISO codes. So that should not be a problem here in the Philippines. And another thing is that language has to be more or less unique. So for example, uh, we, we will not um, 
we will not be having uh, a Wikipedia in Brazilian Portuguese. We would be asking them to just contribute to the Portuguese Wikipedia. So in the same way, if you have, uh, we will not be creating a different dialect version of Wikipedia. Instead, you have to more or less use the uh, mother language. For example, we don't have American English Wikipedia or British English Wikipedia. We just have the English Wikipedia. And another thing is, uh, the number of speakers who, uh, who natively speak the language has to be of sufficient number in order for the Wikipedia to be viable. So, uh, usually, uh, if a language only has a thousand speakers and they are not all interacted um, with using the internet, usually that will not be uh, granted a request to create a Wikipedia in that language. And that's just the process for requesting a new uh, language in Wikipedia. And there's still another process in order to uh, finally approve uh, a language Wikipedia. So basically, when you request, they will set up a test project uh, uh, online on uh, what they call the incubator. So the incubator is where proposals for a new language project to be created. So basically, uh, that's a way to gauge if the, the feasibility of creating a new Wikipedia is uh, good. Because what you really need are, again, active contributors. So we all, basically, we only need at least five active editors who create new articles in the test project. So for example, for Hiligaynon, we just need at least five speakers who regularly create or contribute content to the uh, test Ilongo or Hiligaynon Wikipedia. And furthermore, the interface language of the website also has to be translated into the target language. And they require that at least for the core messages or the core things, these need to be fully translated 100%. And there should be um, also ongoing translation efforts into the other messages or things used by uh, plugins or extensions to the website. And once um, the community has demonstrated that they are active in adding new content articles and doing translation effort, the language committee can then um, give their approval saying, yes, this is a viable Wikipedia language. And so we will be moving the test project from the incubator into its own new domain name. Okay. So basically that's the short uh, process of how a new Wikipedia language is created. Thank you very much. I have a quick follow-up question for Eugene and, and Bob. You know, in terms of, so you mentioned your projects are volunteer, all volunteer based, and you know, there are millions of speakers or thousands of speakers in some of these languages. What sets some of the volunteers apart? What what makes them say, I want to do this, I want to open up Wiki, I want to write for Wikipedia and what I, for example, even though there are thousands of what I speakers, but could you like, like characterize some of the volunteers? Why are they stepping forward to, to, to take part. Yeah, for, for the side of Mozilla, basically uh, these are Firefox fans who would like to see uh, a version of Firefox in their native la uh, language, so let's say for Tagalog. Uh, they are, some of our users are already fed up with you know, other products which were translated into Filipino or Tagalog, which uh, were translated not that, say, not that best. Them because they, they made use of uh, uh, machine translators. So for our project, what we did was we uh, gathered, like what uh, Wikipedia is doing, we gathered uh, users of that language and helped us translate the products so that they know what's the best translation for a particular string or for a particular term. And what, what what's good with the Filipino language is that we can readily uh, uh, borrow uh, terms from the English language because especially for those uh, terms which are hard to translate, especially the technical ones. So what separates them apart is their passion 
at least for Mozillians, because they, they're passionate on what they do, and they, they believe in what Mozilla, uh, Mozilla's mission to promote happiness on the web. Um, for the part of the Wikipedia volunteers, uh, primarily the main motivation is contributing to Wikipedia in itself. Um, most uh, Wikipedians have this innate uh, nature of wanting to share what they know to other people. So that's, that's how I started uh, editing Wikipedia back in 2002. I found out that there's this project called Wikipedia and that you can create your own encyclopedia articles. And when, when I looked around, there was a third of articles related to the Philippines. And that got me hooked into starting articles about places in the Philippines, about topics in the Philippines. And that's, first of all, that's the primary reason why people contribute to Wikipedia, because they want to share their knowledge, they want to share information and spread, um, spread that to their communities. And secondarily, uh, People create uh, Wikipedias in different languages because, yes, they are, for many different reasons, they want to reach their communi local communities. And secondarily, they also want to preserve their language. And having an online encyclopedia in their own language can help to preserve the language because uh, by promoting education as a means of um, teaching the language, you can use an encyclopedia like Wikipedia in order to teach your students about different topics all over the world in their own native language. So that's the prima, uh, that's the, those are the motivations why Wikipedians create, uh, contribute to Wikipedia and why they want to have a Wikipedia in their own languages. And before we open up the question, I'd like to uh, uh, invite Perth McKickham. He's a, a friend of mine, one of the first people that I, I spoke to when I was researching uh, Filipino languages, he works with La Union. He's working with um, and you know, helping to create new policies to incorporate uh, different languages within the public sector. And I'll share a little bit more about that. Should be working. Thank you, Eddie, for that um, inclusion. Uh, yeah, just as uh, a background, I'm. My name is Firth, I'm Canadian, but I've been living in Luzon for four and a half years. And I've been working with local government, particularly the provincial government of La Union, on the inclusion of Ilocano and other minority languages in uh, the public sector and other sectors as well. So just as a little list of milestones in the last four years, we have created an enabling policy of making uh, Ilocano a uh, and uh, official provincial language along with uh, Tagalog and English as national languages. And we have created a set of awards, language awards that we give to commercial establishments or institutions or people that have become champions of local language. Uh, we have uh, funded the purchase of a thousand Ilocano English dictionaries to be distributed to schools. Uh, we have also, um, in, in the ordinance or law, commercial establishments and government offices now need to have bilingual signages, not just in English, but also in a local language, whether it be Lokano or Kamisanense or Ibuloy. Uh, we have funded uh, trainings for daycare teachers so that uh, they are uh, familiar with the new policy of using the mother tongue in uh, not just in grade one, grade two, grade two, but also daycare as well, and a few other activities including celebrations and festivals like Scrabble tournaments in Ilocano, rap competitions or pop competitions in Ilocano, something that is geared towards youth and attract, attractive to, to youth because there is also a dearth of cultural material, new cultural material. We have a lot of folk and indigenous folk uh, traditional material in these languages but not a lot of modern material and that's what really attracts youth. So anyway, that's what I've been involved for the last four years. Uh, when it comes to media, or when it comes to uh, the digital world, we're having a little bit of a harder time. And I think maybe the panelists could uh, provide some comments on this. Many, it is a little bit like Darwinian evolution, or uh, a cruel uh, battle of the survival of the fittest based on demographics or numbers. Manila has 20, Metro Manila has 20 million people, and Philippines only 100 million. So 
a fifth of the entire country is in Manila, and that's the Tagalog-speaking region. And that is the most highly developed part of the Philippines, and that's where many many of the bloggers are, that's where many of the companies are based, that's where Google has its local office, that's where many of the Brazilians are. And to people living in Manila, they often feel that localization means translating into Tagalog or providing products in Tagalog or Filipino. That's great. The inclusion of these products in Filipino or the national languages is a good step, since before everything was in international languages like English. However, we shouldn't stop there. I think that many people, especially from the city, are stuck in this paradigm of thinking that localization means the national language. But we're not like North Korea or South Korea, which is 99% Korean speaking. There, it's a highly homogenous, those are highly homogenous societies, Japan included, where almost everyone speaks the same language. The Philippines is a highly multilingual country. Only 30% of Filipinos actually speak Tagalog as a mother tongue. It's more like India. So I appreciated the former presentation earlier. So we need to have a different strategy when it comes to localization practices in, um, in co uh, companies that are operating in the Philippines. They have to think of a more Indian style multilingualism rather than a Korean or Japanese style monolingualism. So one of our challenges as the provincial government is how do we reach out to media companies, internet companies, computer companies that provide services to people and instill in them the importance of multilingualism in their approach to serving the Filipino people. Thank you. Uh, for the site of Mozilla, uh, actually, the, based on our statistics, most of our localizers are outside of Metro Manila. Because, uh, uh, as I, uh, I asked some of our localizers based in Manila, they're too busy to be part of localization. So, most of our localizers are housewives. So, while waiting for, uh, for their kids while they're in school, they do localizations. So, they're outside in Manila. The thing is, how do we reach out to other people uh, in, uh, in speaking other languages? It's rather hard. One is that uh, they must have the genuine uh, 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 time and they're, they're, they must be able to give effort to something that they love to do. And uh, for the localization here in the Philippines, one is it's rather hard to, uh, to check and evaluate suggestions because our website for translation is basically a suggestion. Anyone who wants to translate or localize uh, Mozilla products can suggest uh, equivalent of strings or terms that, that we have in our products. And it's hard to check if you are not a, a, a user of that language. And here in the Philippines, we lack checkers and evaluators of translation. For Tagalog, uh, Right now, for Mozilla in uh, uh, Firefox and Firefox OS, we are three in the team who's checking on the translation suggestions. I'm based in Manila. The other guy is based in Canada. He's Canadian, but he's speaking Tagalog with you all. And the other guy is based in New York. He's a Filipino based in New York. So it's, it's rather hard because if I'm going to delegate the task of checking the translations, I don't want the product to be translated in a jargon, which is uh, commonly used by teenagers or yeah, those people. And basically, the translated Firefox product will not be used by teenagers. It will be used by adults who love the language. Okay, so right now, since we are a volunteer organization, that's our call. And that's what uh, we're having a hard time to look for volunteers who can genuinely uh, uh, give their time and talent to the cause of the project. Aside from the lack of time and the number of lack of volunteers who can do translation or localization, um, one of the really problematic pro or problems with regards to translating is there's really no native language equivalents for many of the technical terms that you use, for example, when you use a particular software, when you use a particular website. And actually, many of the young people here in the Philippines laugh at the uh, translations, for example, if they 
visit the Google website and they're presented with Tagalog messages. They they laugh at the expeditions because although sometimes they're accurate, they don't the, the, the users don't actually use that particular message or language. And but the, sadly, most people are much more comfortable using software or website or browsing websites in English. And I think uh, I'm really not sure how to solve that problem because, uh, uh, well, another problem also, for example, uh, in particular to Wikipedia. Um, in the Tagalog Wikipedia, which is the most active uh, community here in the Philippines, um, there's still an ongoing debate on how to translate technical terms. Uh, for example, this is not an actual example, but just to prove, uh, just to prove the point. Some people are advocating that we translate mouse into the gut. But, uh, uh, but uh, for the people who laugh, that is laughable because the 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 gut is really the term for a real life mouse, not a computer mouse. So, do you translate literally, as in what the word used to mean, or do you use mouse? As the, as the Tagalog term for the computer mouse. So uh, that's, just, that's, not, uh, that's just an example, but we have many different examples. For example, upload, file, open, save. These things um, do not have native um, translations or concepts. And there's a lot of debate on whether to use English terms in the Tagalog interface or the local language interface but to just use English, plain English because this is what most people would actually understand. Um, let's open it up for questions. Um. Yeah, I have two points. I am from Lydia from the University of the Philippines Visayas, Iliilo. Uh, we have the Central, Central and Wiccan Filipino. It's an office, uh, well, I translated in English, it's a center for the Filipino language. It advocates uh, the Filipino and the native languages, uh, not only in the Philippines, but uh, globally. Uh, one uh, of their advocacy is to differentiate Filipino from Tagalog. So we're here to, to, uh, to learn right. When you use the word Tagalog, you are referring to the people, the cultural group. But when you use the word Filipino, it's the language. Okay, so per perhaps it has to do more work on the, in this area because a lot of people, even among Filipinos, uh, the, the, the nationalities don't know the difference between the two because we, we're just used to that since we were kids. Okay, and um, my point, I'm Hiligay, I speak Hiligay non, I am an Ilonga. So I am just uh, um, uh, surprised that the Hiligay non is not in the Wikipedia yet, but you're telling us that uh, there should there are qualifications, the criteria to qualify for that. Uh, but your minimum number of 1,000, definitely we can uh, suffice this. But it's more of the volunteers uh, that you need. And uh, with our Central Wigan Filipino and our Center for West Design Studies, it's another uh, unit in the university, they are doing translations in the native languages. So perhaps we can, we can mobilize this uh, to uh, offices in the university to tap uh, translators for the for that project. Okay? So exactly how to do it, we don't know. So could you help us? Could you guide us? Um, yeah. we're, we're very much welcome with collaborating with people in Iloilo and nearby provinces in order to create, finally create uh, Wikipedia in Hiligaynon. Yes, not only Hiligaynon, we have Akianon, we have uh, yeah. Actually, actually, there's already a test project for Hiligaynon and Kinaraya uh -huh. in the incubator. So what's the, the only missing is the active community of speakers who uh -huh. contribute and translate. So once we meet that criteria, the language community will be more than happy to approve these as official Wikipedias. That's good news. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Veroniki. I come from Greece. Uh, as a, also a user and editor in Greek Wikipedia, I would like to ask you, you mentioned that uh, there are eight languages 
in Philippines with Wikipedia editions. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask um, uh, what is their size and activity? I mean, how many articles uh, they have in each language? And if, uh, if it is active uh, enough, and for how many years? So, um, as I mentioned earlier, there are eight languages in the Philippines that have Wikipedias. And the most active of these is the Tagalog Wikipedia. Um, for um, reasons that most people here would know, because we do have a lot of Tagalog speakers, or Filipino speakers. Actually, there's still a debate um, whether we, co we should call that Filipino or Tagalog Wikipedia. So that's still an ongoing debate. And the position of the language we give the foundation is that Tagalog and Filipino are just one and the same. But anyway, uh, going back, uh, actually, the, while the Tagalog Wikipedia is the most active Wikipedia, it's not actually the largest Wikipedia in terms of the number of articles. That would go to Warai Warai and Cebuano or Cebuano. Uh, you might be surprised to know that Warai and Cebuano Wikipedias have more than a million articles each. And the reason for that is not because they have a lot of speakers who are contributing. It's because there's a Swedish, Swedish guy who created a bot or a software to create very, very lots and lots of articles about organisms about places in Italy translated into the into Warai and Cebuano. So if you go to the Cebuano Wikipedia or the Warai Wikipedia and you click on a random article, you would most likely get a very short article about some organism or some place in Italy. So that's a, that's a problem. Um, another thing is, um, another metric that we use is the depth of articles, meaning how long and how deep or comprehensive the articles are. In that case, the Ilocano Wikipedia is the most deep Wikipedia here in the Philippines. And that's largely because there's a really, really prolific editor, we don't know who he is, who creates really long articles in Ilocano. So, so um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of different metrics, Tagalog is most active, where in Cebuano have the most articles, while Ilocano has the most comprehensive Wikipedia. So, um, with regards to uh, uh, speakers, um, all of the languages have at least a million speak uh, native language speakers. So, for example, Tagalog has, um, has L1 maybe around 20, 20 to 30 million, Cebuano 20 million, right? down to uh, Chabacano de Zamboanga which has more than a million speakers. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you, Eddie, for organizing this fantastic panel. Uh, thank you to the panelists and to Firth for sharing all the great work that you're doing. Um, I'm from the United States, and over the past year, I've been working on an online organization called Wikitongues, which is dedicated to um, creating and offering for free a complete recorded archive of every language in the world. Um, Unfortunately, we have no volunteers yet here in the Philippines, so I was very excited um, to attend this panel. And I have one quick question for Jocelyn first, um, which is that you mentioned um, that there are 17 deaf institutions here in the Philippines. And so I was wondering how many of the 185 languages of the Philippines are signed. Um, and then my next question, which is kind of for everyone on the panel, is that it seems like Cebuano is indeed one of the most active online languages here in the Philippines, um, but of course, for Wikitongues, it's very important to uh, reach all communities, and we use the internet to do that. So I was wondering if there is a growing presence of minority languages from the Philippines online, and finally, if there are kind of like resources available to figuring out um, uh, like popular hashtags and 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 things like that uh, that are being used here. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I think Anul and I were saying that we will get in touch with you and see how we can work it out. Uh, um, okay, uh, to the question of, um, I got this, you know, the, the statistics that I presented came from Itnolo, but it's a very good question because um, as far as I know with two um, groups that teaches sign language, 
in the Philippines is are all done in English. Um, I may be wrong, maybe someone from the audience, because the ones that I, I, I went to are really done in English. So therefore, it, it is, is very interesting how, you know, um, even this kind of uh, language um, should be also developed, um, you know. So, um, and I think that is something that um, is a challenge also to uh, everyone. Second, I think just one, one sense worth, um, doing advocacy work um, for, uh, for a lot of uh, people, I think in Cebu, for example, um, our newspaper, uh, what Anul mentioned, the local, lang uh, local language uh, papers are actually supporting the English language papers. No? They, um, they, are, they are supporting. That means, um, I think this is one thing very powerful with newspapers is that once you have that written word, it really influences, it gives you that, you know, I think it's symbolism, you know, in culture, symbolism are very important because once you have that, document and people buy into it. That's already what we call in NGO work, the buy-in of your target group so that you already have the advocacy. And what I find very um, interesting is that, you know, um, in the last 20 years, there are, you know, uh, you can see jeepney drivers and tricycle drivers reading so much newspaper, but today, watch when you go around Cebu in the morning, they will always get a newspaper and every time traffic stops, People will live through the newspaper. I'm not sure in Manila, but I'm, I'm, you know, in Cebu. You go around, and they would, um, you know, uh, wait for. And that, this is something that's really very important. That maybe um, I think we can look into also, you know, for for advocacy work. Unfortunately, it's good to know that Cherry Mobile has cheaper apps because, um, you know, one of the problems I think that hinders uh, online. Um, you know, access is the fact that, you know, the gadgets are quite expensive, but, um, you know, with, with this one, maybe we, a lot of things can be done. Uh, I would look forward to the day when drivers and, and tricycle uh, drivers would be carrying their cell phones, which everyone has, but, you know, reads online um, news. Thank you. I hope that um, gives um, you know, some insight. I'd just like to add. Uh, when Joy mentioned about drivers uh, reading news from cell phones, I think the start would be uh, if you notice some taxi cabs now, they have already that cell phone and some apps about the taxi. Now it's only a matter of time that they learn to you know use Facebook and use and 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 I talk with some uh, using ways, just ordinary drivers, taxi drivers using ways to navigate around Cebu in the traffic. I think it's. Uh, that's a good development, but in terms of language, there's a need for for uh, the tech the tech uh, sector industry to coordinate with the academe and talk with uh, other sectors uh, helping develop uh, the language like media. And here in Cebu, uh, uh, there's Super Balita and and uh, Banat News. I like to uh, mention. When we start uh, before Super Balita in Cebu, that was uh, 1993, the newspaper industry here uh, was limited to English. And you know, every newspaper only has around 20,000 readership out of you know, 100,000 million <laughs> reader, uh, potential readers. When we, uh, Super Balita uh, was published, in a few years, in a few months, the circulation grew and outstripped all the English language newspapers because ordinary people uh, when you go to carbon market uh, every stall would have their own newspaper no. and when the competition came out so there's a constant competition and when we and when the other side came out earlier we have to come out earlier and Later, there's Facebook and there's the online versions. So I think we need to really coordinate. And, you know, just uh, one problem with languages is the standards. It's the, and uh, academia is here in the capital and academic uh, teachers here, professors here in the Cebu are trying to work out things and trying to make standards. And we need to coordinate with the tech people because there are lot, lots also of tech initiatives about Cebuano that you cannot uh, 
with no standards in spelling, standards in you know, translation. But, uh, so that's one. Well, thank you very much. I think with that we're gonna we're gonna end. We're gonna have a break right now. But I'd like to thank all the panelists for the participation and for sharing their, their knowledge. And feel free to come up with them during the break to talk more about you know this fascinating subject. Thank you very much.